As much as zombies are ubiquitous in video games these days, that really wasn't the case back in the early 2000s. Resident Evil was the big zombie game series, and maybe you could include House of the Dead as well? You of course had a few licensed games here and there, taking inspiration from, or altogether adapting, a popular movie, and plenty of games that featured zombies in them, but they certainly weren't the selling point, and likely not even the main enemy type. The rare times where zombies were the main focus, the tone was mostly on the less serious end of the spectrum. 2006 saw the release of Dead Rising, and while it had a mostly campy tone, it was basically the only game back then to give players a zombie apocalypse setting that was on par with the best zombie films. When looking back, Dead Rising almost feels like an isolated incident, a happy accident if you will. Even the most recent mainline Resident Evil title, while incredible, strayed away from the series' zombie origins. As movies at the time were likely opening the floodgates in terms of new fans of the horror subgenre, there wasn't much in the way of video game releases to scratch that zombie itch. Until the fall of 2008. Dead Space launched in October of that year, and while the Necromorphs aren't the traditional humanoid zombie types, they are still undead humans, and the game's setting and tone are completely serious and played for horror. Call of Duty World at War came out the second week of November, and in it was a little side game of sorts, zombies. The premise was simple, work together with up to three friends to stay alive as long as you can, fighting off the hordes of zombies approaching your safe house. Playing cooperatively with your buddies and a modern AAA first-person shooter where you fight off zombies? Holy shit, nothing else could possibly compare. Until one week later, when Left 4 Dead released. Hello there. Valve was at the forefront of making high-quality PC games in the late 90s and early 2000s. The Half-Life series is one of the most well-regarded in the first-person shooter genre, and in all of gaming for that matter. As well, the Counter-Strike and Team Fortress games are some of the most influential multiplayer shooters, showing that Valve had a knack for crafting incredible experiences both for single-player and multiplayer. In 2006, they released their first episodic sequel to Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2 Episode 1. Everything at this point had been exclusive to the PC, but in 2007, this changed with the Orange Box, giving console players a taste of what Valve had to offer. Not only did this include the previous Half-Life 2 titles, 2 and 2 Episode 1, it came with three brand new games developed and published by Valve, Portal, Team Fortress 2, and the newest Half-Life installment, Half-Life 2 Episode 2. With this steal of a deal, five good games for the price of one, Console players likely trusted that the next title that came from this company would be great. And it was. Left 4 Dead released the third week of November for the Xbox 360 and PC. It was developed by Valve and Turtle Rock Studios. The latter would be acquired by Valve and renamed Valve South before breaking off to be its own studio again not long after. Besides being a phenomenal game, which I will go very in-depth with in a moment, Left 4 Dead truly provided players at the time with something they hadn't seen before. Not only was this game multiplayer friendly, it was designed around four friends playing together. Not playing a side mode, no, the whole game, all four campaigns, together. Not simply being next to each other while you do your own thing on screen. Cooperation isn't a misused term here, it's necessary to survive. Ignoring all that for now, this was, for all intents and purposes, the first zombie apocalypse setting depicted on PC. I'd almost go as far to say it's the first on consoles as well, but I do think Dead Rising provided a decent window in which to explore that setting with its mall. Even the Resident Evil games mostly showed us big buildings with a couple zombies here and there. Absolutely no slight against those games, they're exceptional in their own ways, but if you were looking for anything akin to 28 Days Later, nothing came anywhere close until Left 4 Dead. The city, and possibly the entire world, is overrun with infected. The zombies come from anywhere and everywhere, are seemingly limitless, and are extremely quick and dangerous. It's the perfect setting for a tightly designed shooter with a heavy focus on cooperation. Tightly designed isn't some fun buzzword I decided to throw in because it makes me sound smart, either. This game, from top to bottom, is all killer, no filler. It's honestly incredible to me how well considered this game is. Almost everything you can think of either has multiple purposes, or pushes players to engage with cooperation. No matter what element you point to, you can circle back to the same question and get a satisfying answer. Does this have multiple functions? Does this encourage group strategy? Crouching can let you get into small entryways, of course, aid in sneaking past the witch, and keep you lower to the ground so a different player can fire over you without dealing friendly fire damage. 
The flashlight helps in dark areas, but since there's no battery meter, what's the point in being able to turn it off? Well, the witches react to the flashlight, so being able to turn it off and on has a clear purpose. Your melee attack is very weak compared to your guns, but it also pushes the zombie horde away from you, clearing up space without putting your team in danger of hitting each other. Pills grant you temporary health, which on its face helps with not dying of course, but it's also beneficial for when a player falls below 40 health and their character starts to limp. The short-term boost in HP will keep them from slowing their teammates down, thus aiding the overall goal of getting through the level as a team in one piece, and it's also a faster heal compared to the med kits, so it's easy to use when on the run. You can use the first aid kits to heal yourself, of course, but you can also heal an ally as well. The safe room doors act as the end goal for almost every level, but they're also the only doors that the infected can't break through, providing a decent quick defense if you're overwhelmed early in a level, or at the end if you're waiting on somebody, or just want to make sure you make it out alive. The random empty closet rooms can be a temporary safe place to heal yourself, used as a defensive bunker to hole up in, and they're also the respawn location for survivors after they've died. Doors can be broken down, but they're also valid lines of defense, and shooting a hole through the middle could make climactic encounters more manageable. Since the director can spawn in zombies and special infected in nearby rooms when you aren't looking, closing an open door as you run along could very well benefit you later on. Opening doors to random rooms will slow you down, thus allowing more time for the director to build up zombie hordes behind the scenes, but those out-of-the-way rooms could house beneficial items given that they spawn in different locations each time, thus making doors and the rooms they lead to a microscopic game of risk versus reward. You can pick up and throw gas cans, propane tanks, and oxygen tanks. They can make for effective trap placements to take out a mass of zombies while conserving your ammo, but because you can't do anything else besides push zombies away with them in your hands, transporting the environmental explosive to a potentially more helpful location is a risk, so your teammates will have to protect you. Losing your HP and needing to be revived by a teammate is obviously cooperation, but the same thing goes for falling off a ledge. While you can still leap off or get smacked far over the edge, more often this is turned into a team building exercise where an ally has to pick you back up. Even better, as the time it takes to pick someone up puts that survivor in risk of falling off themselves, as geniusly, certain special infected have the capacity to send someone over as well. Smokers could pull you, tanks could punch you, and boomers and hunters, if they stagger you backwards, could also send you reeling as well. The special infected as a whole were masterly crafted around the idea that a group of four would need to stick together to survive. Hunters and smokers debilitate their targets, so unless a different ally comes to save them, it's all but guaranteed that that survivor will die. They can be easily disposed of if it's a one-off and if the group stays with each other, but if a hunter tackles a straggler, then a smoker pulls away the helper, and if a boomer then draws the horde towards one of them, things can turn to shit really quickly. It can sometimes be difficult to get your group out of a death spiral, as when one person gets distracted or pulled away, that's one less person to help another survivor when they might need it. The best defense against losing your squad one by one is to simply never allow the first domino to fall. Always stick together, never let anyone lag behind. When a problem does arise, no one tries to play the hero, everyone pitches in. When things start to get too messy, helping a drowning survivor might result in you being pulled down with them, so at times, the best solution just may very well be to push on and cut your losses. If you don't learn this lesson early on, or you misjudge the danger of the situation, this can easily result in a team wipe. Like I've said before, Left 4 Dead isn't a game where you and your friends play separately, but at the same time, no, cooperation is necessary. This thought process is encapsulated quite well with the, albeit kind of unremarkable, Tank Special Infected. It being named Tank really feels like lampshading in a way, since it is really just a big brute with a bunch of health, but sometimes the simple solution is the right one. On higher difficulties especially, a tank requires everyone's undivided attention. They have so much health and can easily incapacitate a survivor in a moment's notice, meaning all hands on deck are necessary to take the thing down. If I really wanted to, I could probably make an argument on why the shortcuts and even ladders serve multiple functions or encourage team strategy, but I think you get the idea. Another word you could use to describe all of this is efficiency. Left 4 Dead is nothing but efficient. There aren't any wasted or even underutilized mechanics. Everything serves multiple functions or aids the teamwork mentality. The cinematic trailer doubling as the attract video when booting up the game also fits the bill of efficiency. This four-minute clip shows off the characters and their personalities, 
sets the tone of the game, demonstrates how important teamwork is to the overall goal, and even has a mini-arc of its own, similar to the rise and falls of tense action we'll see with each individual chapter of the game. It also shows off almost every single element you'll see in a typical Left 4 Dead match. The witch enemy type paired with its musical cue, the fact that flashlights alert witches, that you can use doors as barricades, that smokers can grab and pull you away from the group, that you should have a Merry Christmas, that pipe bombs attract zombies before exploding, that hunters pounce on survivors, that some cars have alarms which alert the horde of zombies, that tanks are a thing and can toss cars and even throw chunks of the ground, and look at that, a ledge pull up. Throughout, we even see the survivors using a large percentage of the weapons as well. Double pistols, shotgun, assault rifle, and SMG. Boomers are missing, as well as Molotovs, first aid kits, pills, and throwable gas can objects. But aside from that, this is a pretty succinct little snapshot of Left 4 Dead's gameplay, and leads directly into the first chapter of the No Mercy campaign. In my eyes, one of the things that really sets Left 4 Dead apart from a lot of the more modern games is the tone and the humor, and this trailer really exemplifies what I'm talking about. The zombies aren't played for laughs, the setting is taken 100% seriously. The survivors are presented with a hopeless, near-unwinnable situation, and they don't downplay it at all. They take it in, while the game tells the player with its visual and audio design that, yeah, these are grim circumstances. You might not call this a horror game, but it has tension, stakes, suspense. It's at the very least horror adjacent. There's certainly not a pop song blaring in the background to make the game feel fun. Don't get me wrong, Left 4 Dead is immensely fun, but the game doesn't try to convince you of that fact. It plays its zombie apocalypse setting straight, and trusts the players that they'll have a good time with the game on their own. The characters have an endearing chemistry with each other, and they do joke around here and there, but the best part is, no one is trying to be Tony Stark. Bill's interaction with Francis is funny, but they aren't trying to make the fake audience laugh, or even Lewis laugh, even though he does. They're just talking to each other in a way that conveys they've already spent some time together and are closer than total strangers. Lewis freaking out about the witch could also be seen as comedy relief, but he's simply reacting to the near-death experience he's having. He's not hamming it up for the crowd. Bill's final line is my favorite of the trailer, since it's funny, but not haha -ha funny. It's dark humor, making light of their bleak outlook on survival. The situation they're in is dire, but there's a twinge of deadpan humor somewhere in there, mostly thanks to the delivery. We made it! I can't believe we made it! Son, we just crossed the street. Let's not throw a party till we're out of the city. The voice actors for all of the four survivors are solid as hell. Earl Alexander as Lewis. Sir, please, we're not infected. Jen Taylor as Zoe. Oh, nice, a cabin in the middle of nowhere. I know how this movie ends. Vince Valenzuela as Francis. Listen, candy pants, we can make you open that goddamn door. Can you really? And Jim French as Bill. Jim French passed away in 2017, and this might just be me being selfish, but I kind of wish he did more voice acting work. Truly, Bill was voiced to perfection. I love how well the grizzled war veteran character came through. Jim French is a legend purely going off of his work on this game. I'm certainly glad that Valve got him on board for a few of their projects. No, 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 no one gets in here until I know you're immune. Son, we're immune, we're tired, and there's infected in the damn woods. Now cut out the shit and let us in. As I mentioned earlier, the humor is definitely present in Left 4 Dead, but it feels tonally consistent with the rest of the game, and in some cases, hilarious. Some of the writing on the walls honestly made me laugh out loud, especially the We Are The Real Monsters one, and Allison's poem and the reactions to it. Even though these gags are meant to make the player laugh, these are unobtrusive and believable to me. If you've ever seen the weird genre of tweets where it depicts world-ending events happening while Twitter users react to it in an almost meme -y fashion, I think this is basically the same thing. The reason those tweets are so great in my eyes is because I think that's genuinely what would happen to some extent. Yeah, of course many would panic and post about doom and gloom scary shit, which we do see here as well on some walls, but you'd of course see the other side as well. People joke around and make light of every situation online, no matter how horrifying. This just feels like that, an anonymous message board of sorts for people to communicate with each other, which opens the door to people reacting the way Allison's haters did. There's no time for self-indulgence, Allison. We're in a zombie apocalypse. It's time to meme on this wall. With the dialogue, it's mostly just two characters talking with each other about their preferences or the next plan. The closest thing to annoying I ever saw was Zoe making an Aliens reference 
and the reoccurring bit where Francis hates everything. I ever tell you how I feel about helicopters? <sighs> Do you hate them? I guess I did tell you. The Aliens reference felt surprisingly fine to me, and I think it's because it seemed like it was Zoe making the movie reference, not the game, and the characters even laugh when they hear it. And come at you and they never goddamn stop. Game over, man! Game over! What the hell was that? <laughs> Bill seems confused, but that would make sense since he's a bit on the older side. The Francis hating everything bit could have easily gotten stale pretty quickly, but because there's so many possible dialogue lines for so many different situations, it didn't repeat enough for me to get tired of it. I hate stairs. In fact, the slow realization that he's announced he's hated almost everything at a certain point was pretty great. I hate elevators. Seriously, this dude hates basically everything. I hate helicopters. I hate hospitals. And doctors and lawyers and cops. Okay. Francis, is there anything you don't hate? You know what I don't hate? I don't hate this. Never did the voice lines divulge into one-liner jokey jokes, and I'm thankful as hell for that. In addition to the voice lines, the other bits of audio design are superb as well. It strikes the perfect balance of completely engrossing you in the game world, while also conveying a ton of information to the player purely off of sound effects alone. One of the main goals the designers had for the music in Left 4 Dead was to make it good enough and unobtrusive enough so that players wouldn't want to turn it off. As someone who generally prefers to listen to something else while I play a game I'm already familiar with, I can't really do that here. The audio is far too important to the experience. Every special infected has their own separate audio cues for when they're nearby, as well as when they attack and die. Smokers will cough when present on the map, so if you hear that, you know you could get pulled away at any second. Their tongue snare has a very distinct noise to go along with it, so even if nobody gets grabbed, you know there's a smoker out there who is close enough to try. After being shot and killed, they always make this noise and produce a puff of clouds. The boomers will gurgle and groan basically all the time, so they're very easy to hear from a distance. Their puking noise is gross, as it should be, and they explode and send their juices flying when defeated. Hunters are a little more unique. They don't make their idle noise when standing, it's only when they crouch. They can't perform their pounce attack unless crouched, so once you hear their low growls, you know one is in position. I believe they have a recognizable screech in non-versus settings when the bot has a survivor in their sights before a pounce as well. Hunter! Their howls are one of the scariest and most distinctive sounds in the game, echoing off the walls the moment they leap out of a crouched position. Normally it's when a hunter is actively trying to pounce on a survivor, but in versus mode, you can spam it to distract survivors with the constant racket. Interestingly enough, apparently the hunter also makes a distinct noise when they break down a door compared to when any other zombie or infected does. Another nice audio warning for players to listen for. If you're hard of hearing, the full captions do a satisfactory job at letting the player in on important information, which was not something too common back in 2008. It seemed like the three basic special infected were accompanied by a musical motif unique to them, but after hearing the developer commentary on the music director, it may have just been repeated happy accidents. The ones I heard most often were the piano or brass horn footstep stumble type of tune, or the high strings or high keys on the piano three times. When a horde of zombies gets spawned in, you hear a distant horn calling in the background. Then, once the zombies land on screen, a boom of a bass drum hits and the music gets more frantic. The hordes cry out and a climactic score kicks in when you activate the finale or crescendo events. The tanks have their own yells and screams, but more importantly, you'll always know when one is around once their bombastic entrance music starts playing. 
I found that in extremely hectic battles, such as on survival mode, the gunfire and other sounds can drown out the tank music, which is a little unfortunate. The witches also have their own specific audio cue, and they're handled more dynamically. You can hear their sobs from very far away, and that alone is pretty unnerving the first few times you hear it. This will likely make one of the survivors announce that a witch is nearby, so everyone should turn off their flashlights. Shit. Witch! Turn those flashlights off. Her music, however, is even more interesting. The closer you get to her, the louder the foreboding horror soundscape gets. If she starts to get restless, you can hear it through her growls. And when she's completely aggroed, she wails as the piano slams the high keys frantically. Not only are these sounds important to listen for when trying to survive, it elevates these campaigns into feeling almost like a movie. Many of these setting the mood jingles you hear are what you'd expect when watching a film to keep the tense atmosphere. This makes it all the better, since that's quite clearly what Valve and Turtle Rock were going for. Every campaign gets a movie poster with its own tagline as well. After you finish the finale, there's an end credits with your stats, and it even has the usual no animals or whatever were harmed during the making of this film, except it's zombies, and it's how many you all killed during this campaign. It's pretty remarkable how much they nailed every aspect of the experience. This'll be the first game, Save Dead Rising, that even comes close to feeling like the best zombie films, Screw it, give the entire presentation a horror movie vibe, filled with characters that all sound like real people, a background soundtrack that slides in when needed to fit whatever mood each scene is going for, give each campaign a gimmick and a poster, roll credits, and there we go. The cherry on top of this thematic ice cream sandwich is the name they went with for the AI program that dictates the pacing of the game, the director. There's a musical director of sorts as well that's separate from this, which controls the player-specific soundscape. For example, if only one of you is close to the witch, then only that person should have her song kick in, and etc. The main director controls things on a grander scale, since they impact the entire game. It's responsible for deciding when and where to spawn a random horde of zombies, when and where to spawn in special infected, the witch and tank locations, and even the placements for all of the healing items and weapons along the way. First aid here. The director tool itself made the designer's jobs a lot easier, since they just have to tweak one part of the code and boom, there's a new take on the level. Because it's so refined, it works just as well when populating any new maps they create, or even for community-made maps as well. I don't know the specifics of how much control the director has as the game is going on, and the fandom page didn't have as many concrete answers as I'd like, but the part that stuck out to me was the multiple different phases, which is evident after you play the game for a while. The build, the peak, and the relax. This is what I was talking about when discussing the cinematic trailer. Every chapter feels like it has an arc to it. No matter what, you're going to see the intensity ramp up due to mobs funneling in, a crescendo event taking place, or perhaps a tank and or a witch showing up. Afterwards, you're almost always afforded the chance to catch your breath, then repeat the process over until you reach the safe room. The tanks and witches have a few places they're likely to spawn, and there are enough non-scripted encounters to make it feel genuinely unique each and every time. For example, I retried No Mercy Chapter 5 on Expert many times by myself and saw a lot of variety, even in that one minute before climbing up the ladder for the finale. Sometimes there was a tank near the ladder, sometimes it was in the hallway, and more often there wasn't one at all. Because the director makes every campaign playthrough a little different, we could liken this to the now continued prevalence in procedural generation, most commonly found in roguelite games. The furthest back I can remember hearing about this idea of a game being different every time you play was on the box of Champions of Norath. But of course, Rogue is the reason why the bad and confusing genre tags of roguelite and roguelike exist in the first place. While I personally don't enjoy those types of games all that much, in Left 4 Dead, every playthrough being slightly different hits the perfect spot for me. The campaigns are roughly 30 minutes to an hour or so, and there's really not that much the game can do to completely bamboozle your run. You always have a decent chance of making it to the next safe house. Yeah, some witch and tank placements can be rough, but honestly, because there's no out-of-game progression of any kind, and because you can keep retrying from the last safe room you visited, it makes the whole experience so much smoother and far less irritating. Apparently this wasn't the case at first. Early playtesters did have to retry from the first chapter again, which to me sounds too punishing. 
Some will likely feel differently, but I have no problem if a game is almost unfair with its difficulty if it gives me somewhat lenient checkpoints, and not having to go back to the first stage every time you fail makes the party wipe scenarios not feel as painful. If you're going for specific achievements, your mileage may vary, of course, but the real achievements are the fun you had along the way, right? Speaking of Dead Rising earlier, there's an achievement for Zombie Genocide Ist, which requires one more kill than Dead Rising Zombie Kill achievement. Gotta love it. Purely subjective here, but I really like how Valve structured these achievements. Going solely off the percentage of players who have them, and my personal playthrough as well, there's a wide range of them that are pretty easy to get if you simply play the game for a while, there's a handful that you have to go out of your way to get, and there's another handful that are decently difficult and require a lot of time and effort to acquire. I don't know, the fact that I could see when I or other players got achievements just felt fun. Hey, good job, dude, you got the thing! Returning to the director for a moment, one of the most interesting things I read when researching this game was the difference between wandering zombies and mobs. These two are unrelated to each other in the director's eyes. One is just the zombies you find along the way that aggro when you get too close, potentially even spawning off the stage and running at you when you've been spotted, and the other is the mass of zombies that get teleported onto the map nearby to all run directly towards your party with no hesitation. Initially, when I was brainstorming about Left 4 Dead, I was fiddling with the idea that the normal zombies become so standard after a while, they more or less blend into the map itself. They're an extension of the environment, whereas the special infected are the real quote-unquote enemies of the game, the ones that behave with some form of intelligence and are given AI that can make decisions for itself. Then I thought about how little credit I was giving the common infected. Their pathfinding is very impressive, and there aren't any places where a player can stand but a zombie can't, which is smart. More importantly, they not only deal a lot of damage on high difficulties, 20 on expert per hit, but even on advanced, if you don't find a good place to hole up in a zombie storm, you could easily become surrounded and not be able to move. Besides the damage they inflict, they also slow you down tremendously. One hit, even on normal difficulty, will basically have your speed. This was implemented to make it less likely that a lone player could plow through every horde of zombies they come across when running off on their own. You're dependent on your team to help clear the mass engulfing and slowing you down. Clearly zombies are a real threat and should be respected as such. They can so easily be the difference between falling behind in a crucial moment or staying alive because you're still on pace with your team. But doesn't what I just said sound awfully familiar? They drain your movement speed and deal small bits of damage as you try to make your way through the game world? Are the regular zombies really all that different from Blight Town or the Swamp and the Valley of Defilement? Functionally? Not especially. Climbing up onto high obstacles is advantageous due to the swarming nature that is the zombie horde, almost as if they're a force of nature somewhat similar to a tidal wave of sorts. Zombies flooding your surroundings, seeping into the narrow crevices to attach onto you, submerging you down into the sea of infected flesh. It's scarier than anything you could possibly imagine. It turns this regular level into a water level. All that being said, what truly swayed my opinion on this thought experiment was the enlightenment I gained when researching about the director. No, these zombies aren't the enemies, the special infected aren't the enemies. Truly, the main antagonist is the director itself. When I play a game of Left 4 Dead now, the language I use when thinking and strategizing have changed from what I used previously. No longer is it, will there be a tank up ahead, or I hope there's not a smoker nearby. It's, I hope the director hasn't spawned a smoker up ahead, or why the fuck did the director place the witch right in front of the only door out of this place? What an asshole. Yes, the tools at which the director uses to challenge us are what's dealing the damage, but that's like saying the burglar didn't stab the person, the knife did. The director is our adversary here, and I think that's pretty neat. The guns are split into two tiers, pistol, pump shotgun, SMG, hunting rifle, assault rifle, auto shotgun. Looking at them on a macro scale, even though the tier 2 guns are objectively better than tier 1, because Left 4 Dead is a series of self-contained campaigns, nothing ever gets tossed aside. In an alternate realities iteration of Left 4 Dead, where this is all one long story mode, the moment you grab that better rifle, why would you ever think to grab an SMG again? Even in a game like Battlefront 2 Classic, once you obtain the cheater pistol through the medals on your account, why would you ever go back to the worst variation? No, it's only because these smaller repeated campaigns exist and function like they do that nothing gets neglected or thrown into a ditch. It circles back to the efficiency talking point. 
Yeah, you do get a sense of progression when you get the better guns, and it does function as a quasi-reward of sorts, but I just love how the starting weapons aren't abhorrent by any means, and that they're always something you'll be seeing in every single playthrough. I can so easily imagine a worse version of Left 4 Dead, where some stupid out-of-game progression dictates what weapons and throwables you start off with. Yeah man, can't wait to unlock the sniper, or the grenade launcher, or whatever. Also, I'm not referring to anything specific. If Back 4 Blood does do this, that's hilarious, but I have not and will not look anything up about that game. For now, at least. The weapons all pack a punch. It's very clear when you've hit a target, or fired your gun in the first place, since they light up the room and are loud as shit. There's something about the way the zombies sometimes drop the moment you deal a killing blow that just feels so satisfying. It's weird how this is like the exact opposite appraisal as my Earth Defense Force videos, but perhaps this comes down to state changes and expectations. A zombie sprinting, then dropping dead the moment you fire at them feels great, as does blasting a mostly stationary bug miles away with a rocket launcher. Depending on the type of gun, enemy type, and distance, the zombies can be sent flying at times as well, but more often I see them mostly collapsing and piling up on each other, which gives a real visceral feeling to the act of mowing down a horde. Their limbs being blown off and etc. is also nice, nothing too ridiculous, but just enough to look impactful. There's a ludicrous amount of death animations, and that's due to the designers hiring a professional stuntman to mocap hundreds of different dying motions. They took into account being shot by different guns, and even from different directions. The way the wandering infected all exist in the environment without being aggro to the player is also really creepy and makes it feel all the more believable. They hold onto themselves, stare off into walls, sit on the floor doing nothing, throw up on the ground, scratch their head. It's really great stuff. In terms of the individual guns and weaponry, I think both iterations of the shotgun are the most interesting. With the pump variation, you can melee attack the moment after you fire to cut down on the time between shots. At first, when I saw someone do this, I thought it was some glitch or something, or at the very least, some high-level skill move. Nah, it's fairly simple. I've seen someone online say that it better directs the shots to reduce spread for long distances. I can't say I for sure saw the results of that when testing on the walls, but against faraway enemies, yeah, I can kind of see it. For both shotguns, constantly reloading before they empty seems to be the best strategy here. If you expend all your ammo, there's an extra animation before being able to fire again, Whereas if you do it incrementally, it saves time overall, and you'll then ideally never have to reload all 8 or 10 shells. The sniper scope is nice, and I do like that it's a tier 2 weapon, so you can't start with a scoped rifle right away. Double pistols are also a great option, and sometimes it balances out your other gun quite well, like being the more accurate choice over the shotgun. For your other equipment, I like that the medkits don't have an absolute heal amount, instead it gives back 80% of the health you're currently missing. This means you jump from low HP to high HP with one usage, but it also means you can never get back to 100 health, meaning it's always better to save them for when you really need it. Unless you have an extra, I suppose, and it'd be a waste not to. The long window of vulnerability when using a medkit makes it a risk when you're not in a completely safe area, further encouraging a teammate to watch your back. It's also neat that if you heal in a dark room, you'll get a spotlight on your character. I've already talked about the pills and how smart of an idea they were, but the one thing I'll say about the throwables is how incongruent the pipe bomb behaves. When you trigger a car alarm, the zombies don't go attacking the car, they come for you. When you activate a crescendo or panic event, the zombies go for you, not the source of the sound, which is sometimes still making noise. I obviously like the pipe bomb quite a lot, so I'm happy it functions like it does, but if anything, it would make more sense if car alarms drew zombies towards them instead of you. It would be one less hazard on the map, but considering that they seem to stay in fixed positions, I'm not as fond of them as I want to be. For example, the first chapter of No Mercy will always have this car in this spot that has an alarm, and for the second chapter, it's this one. It'd be more interesting if the cars that have alarms were randomized to some extent. The metal detector in Dead Air is obviously always going to be there, but that seems like a fair concession to make, since that's really the only spot you'd expect a metal detector. I know I'm spending a lot of time discussing the car alarms, considering how infrequently they come into play, but with how much they go against the pipe bomb logic, and how static they are, if I had to pick out anything about this game that I don't absolutely love, it's this. It makes sense that zombies shouldn't be able to trigger the alarms, but one time a tank chose that car to use as a weapon, and I think it would have been chaotic and kind of fun if the tank did end up triggering the horde to come attack us with his punch. Oh well. All of the equipment you grab, be it throwables, guns, medkits, and pills, show up on your character's model. 
Immersion is both a big and also not big part of this game. The sound design, tense atmosphere, high stakes, and believable world building makes it easy to get engrossed in the gameplay, but it's also easy to ignore the ways in which Left 4 Dead isn't trying to hide the fact that it's a game. Even when we disregard the online setting, you still get told who killed a special infected on screen, you see outlines around the survivors when they're obstructed, even seeing the red outline of the enemy that has them trapped, and achievements also show up on the side when you've unlocked them. If you don't have them turned off, you may also get pop-up hints about what to do and what not to do. Your mileage may vary, but because it's so consistent, and the campaigns feel more or less like bot-infested multiplayer matches anyway, none of this takes me out of the moment at all. The outlines around the survivors specifically makes things a lot clearer than it would be otherwise, which I think is more important in this instance than trying to get the player to see exactly what their character would see. That being said, I still really like the effort to place the items on each survivor. It's just a nice thing that I like. The survivors calling out when they see an item or grab it is great for a lot of reasons that I'll put up on screen, but honestly, I just love hearing Lewis say he's grabbing pills. Grabbing pills. Some of those reasons are also why survivors announcing the presence of a special infected or the current status of one of their teammates is also a net positive, which I'll show on the screen again. The medkit animation appearing to have the survivor genuinely patch up their arms and legs is also a nice touch, lending good reason as to why it takes so long to do. Some of the Crescendo event interactables don't do as good a job, but I don't really care about that to be honest. Although all of the special infected help kill off the group of survivors in their own ways, to me, the smokers are the scariest of the bunch. Even though tanks are brutal on higher difficulties, you'll usually have everyone on board when taking them on, and Molotovs make it mostly a waiting game anyway. Which is you can sneak by or crown yourself once you get good enough, the hunters are dangerous, but you can utilize the shotgun melee combo to stun them if you miss a skeet shot, making them not as much of a threat if you're not in versus mode. Boomers can be annoying if they somehow sneak up on you, but they're so loud, basically die in a single shot, and need to get very close to do anything. The smoker is what truly haunts my nightmares. When a hunter traps you, you're in that same spot. If a smoker nabs you with his tongue, the distance between you and salvation gets stretched further and further. On Expert especially, if you get grabbed by a smoker and your teammates aren't literally right next to you, you could easily get incapacitated due to how hard they hit once you're all the way in. They can also pull you out of windows and off ledges, which is just cruel. Remember when I talked about how I could argue that ladders encourage teamwork and or have multiple uses? Well, apparently peeking your head above ground isn't a smart thing to do when you're the first one up the ladder. This first up the ladder ordeal was apparently something the developers noticed when groups would playtest this campaign. If everyone was at full health and doing fine, they would fly up no problem, but if some were injured, they would talk it out and usually make the player with the most health go first. Their reasoning being that they can take more damage from infected, but for me, it really is all about the smoker and their deadly tongue. The smokers aren't as bad when you play with a good group of players, but the bots are truly awful when it comes to knowing what to do in these scenarios. I've heard online somewhere that Valve and Turtle Rock intentionally made the bots play subpar so that players will always want real people on their team, and I get it, but I also think they went too far in some cases. From what I gathered when playing and reading what others have said online, bots are better than horrible players, but are so much worse than good players. They don't friendly fire you at all, which is nice, they take down common wandering infected decently, and they definitely always stay by your side, for the most part anyway. It certainly feels like they go the long way around whenever they can, meaning if you jumped down somewhere and got grabbed by an enemy, you could be stuck there for a while. An irritating inconvenience on normal, but almost a guaranteed failure on advanced or expert. Their priorities are also out of whack. They often go for down survivors instead of helping someone who is trapped by a hunter or smoker, and even ignore someone on a ledge in favor of someone being attacked by a tank. They sometimes just don't know what they should be doing at all and stand there for a bit before helping out, and it seems like sometimes their priorities conflict or something when two people are in need of help. Just watch this mess of a shit show. Yeah, don't help me up with the time you had. Absolutely, yeah. They aggro the witch fairly often, and for some reason barely even start shooting at her until she's knocked down the aggressor teammate? They don't take no for an answer when your health is low, they will use their medkit on you once they catch up, and they don't handle pills correctly at all, at least going off the little knowledge I have of the game. 
They'll shoot the tank even though it's already in its death animation, and they'll shoot at a horde of zombies even if they're clearly all about to die from a pipe bomb, both of those situations wasting their ammo. They can't utilize or even pick up throwables at all, which is kind of annoying since you basically are encouraged to just chuck every pipe bomb you find at that point. They rarely crouch, meaning it's tough to help them take down hordes of zombies since they're constantly getting in your way, and the worst part, for me, is they both never leave your side, but also never come close enough. When I don't want them near me, like when the tank is about to burst out of the train car in Sacrifice, they're like glue. When I want them to fall back to a safe area with me so we can all utilize the obvious choke point, they stand just outside and tank all the damage. Again, this definitely does make me want to play with other people, but at the same time, like, god damn, it's rough. There's a few Steam Workshop add-ons that help with the bot AI in the second game, which I absolutely will try out when I get to it since I do like playing offline, but the bots make it difficult. Playing with a friend group is the ideal and where the most fun is, but when your buds aren't available, the public lobbies are what you get, and it's a pretty mixed bag. I'm sorry, but I'm not a huge fan of seeing hentai slapped on walls everywhere I go. It's also kind of difficult to know what strategy the other players want to go with, and I can never tell when I should be the one waiting for the others to lead, or if I should get things moving since they're waiting on me. Some players handle this just fine with their messages, but often I felt like I was either falling behind or rushing forward. Neither are optimal, depending on the group, and you may very well see everyone nope out of your lobby because of it, or kick you if they have the votes. In terms of the four difficulties, I think Advanced is almost the perfect challenge for me. The bots are a little too stupid to do it solo, but with a friend or two, Advanced is just the proper amount of punishment to go with my skill level. Expert is a good time when you get good enough, and especially when you have a trustworthy squad of four. Zombies dealing so much damage really forces you to coordinate well through the whole campaign. You can solo if you want to. You can leave your friends behind. But when the tank spawns and if the mob spawns, well, there's no success this time. Uh, if I'm playing alone, though, I kind of wish I could just keep it on normal, since I like how simple and enjoyable that feels for the majority of it, but the tanks are just way too easy. They have so little health, we can basically shoot them for a few seconds straight and then they're dead. It's extremely underwhelming, to be honest. I'll talk a bit about Left 4 Dead 2 at the end, and of course it will get its own dedicated video at some point in the future, but normal felt more challenging there, which I appreciated. Versus mode as a whole is pretty enjoyable all things considered. I only have two small issues, the first being that you can hit teammates as special infected. The developer commentary mentioned they had to remove the mechanic where survivors could shove each other, since veterans could grief newbies by pushing them off ledges. None such safeguard exists for the special infected. If players want to be assholes, they can smack you off a building. I get that friendly fire being possible gives the special infected a disadvantage, which is probably for the best in terms of overall balancing, but the griefing potential is still annoying. My other quibble is that you can't play this offline without modding the game in some way, which is a shame, since playing as the special infected is a great time, and you may not always want to deal with the veterans in public lobbies. RIP. Looking past those two molehills, when everyone's having a good time and is mostly around the same skill level, Versus mode is an absolute blast. Being able to work in tandem with your teammates is so gratifying, especially when the smoker and hunter work together. Even though it's satisfying as all hell when it goes your way, the times where the tank can use cars to instantly in-cap survivors feels a bit overpowered. You could easily blame the team, though, for their poor decision-making when choosing a locale to fight the tank in. The scoring system and overall goal of versus mode is really great, and this basically aligns with something I mentioned in my Dying Light video. I personally really didn't like the invasion mechanic, since it thrusted a half-hour multiplayer match onto a player when they may not have wanted one at that time. That game seems like it is going for a more immersive experience, so the day changing to night on some settings, the balancing being completely out of whack due to the variables in player level and equipment, and even team size, and human players able to cheat, essentially, completely kills the mood for me. Again, great that you can turn that off, which I always did when I wanted to have a good time, but the reason this relates to Left 4 Dead is that Versus Mode both is the same game and is something you choose to play. If you, say, chose an offline campaign and other players could invade and play as the Special Infected, yeah, that would be kinda silly, but this is its own separate mode to pick. 
The best part is that you're playing the same game. You have the same goal when you're the survivors. Get to the next safe house alive. That's what you do when you play a campaign with bots. That's what you do when you play a campaign with humans. That's what you do when you play versus mode. Comparing the two teams' runs based solely on how well they did on each chapter, either distance-based if they all die, or health-based if they succeed, is the best way to go about it. It's literally testing and evaluating them on the mechanics and strategies they'll have already been employing during non-versus campaign runs. It works so well and is so smooth of a transition that you could easily theorize that the versus mode was what came first, then the campaign afterwards. That was my suspicion anyway, so I wasn't super surprised when I heard that confirmed in the developer commentary. Yes, that was the order of events. The versus mode at one point was the default and only game mode. Like I said, it would be a little better if there were settings where you could practice playing as the infected on your own offline, since that's the only missing piece of the puzzle here, but that's really the only issue I have. We could hearken all of this back to efficiency once more. These four original campaigns and two additional DLC ones got so much mileage due to it being the setting for every game type available. The AI director making every run feel different did so much for the longevity of this game, truly. The designers mentioned that due to the variety the AI director brought to the table, they never got tired of playing their game even after three years, and I believe it. The survival mode is basically the finale and crescendo events, but it keeps going. There's a bronze, silver, and gold medal for 4 minutes, 7 minutes, and 10 minutes survived, respectively. There seems to be a lax in restrictions for the special infected here, as multiple smokers and hunters can be spawned at a time, which causes absolute mayhem. Three smoker pulls at once, good lord. Welcome to my nightmare. You can play a ton of different maps that were present in the main campaigns, but there's also a lighthouse last stand setting, which is unique to this game mode. It is pretty fun, but the trek from the bottom starting position to the top is crazy nerve-wracking given that the game spawns in hordes almost right away. Unlike versus mode, you can play this one without anyone joining your lobby, so it is possible to go solo with bots. I almost got silver with them one time, but that was about it. If they could rescue you from smokers or hunters in a timely fashion, maybe, but because they can't, it's basically a death sentence. In fact, at one point the tank was even more helpful, since he ran over and freed me from my trapped position. Can't believe I can more reliably trust the tank to rescue me in these scenarios. The game originally launched with four campaigns, those being No Mercy, Death Toll, Dead Air, and Blood Harvest. When first announcing Left 4 Dead 2, many fans were skeptical of a new game releasing so soon, and considering this is an online-focused game, the community was worried the player base would be splintered, or the first game forgotten about. Valve seemed committed to not letting the first game fade away so quickly, adding in a new campaign, Crash Course, which bridged the gap between No Mercy and Death Toll. No Mercy ends with a helicopter rescue, Crash Course begins with a helicopter crash, it ends with a truck escape, and Death Toll begins on a road that has its bridge destroyed. The continuity of the story backdrop isn't hugely important, but it is kind of neat to tie these events together somewhat. This DLC released a month and a half or so before Left 4 Dead 2 came out. About a year later, Valve released another DLC campaign, The Sacrifice, for both iterations of Left 4 Dead. It was originally meant to be exclusive to the first game, but given that everything else made its way into the sequel eventually, it makes sense for it to be in both games. It's a nice send-off, serving as the prequel to a DLC campaign in Left 4 Dead 2 called The Passing, where the new survivors meet up with three of the original survivors, the canon here is that Bill sacrificed himself, restarting the generator so the others could make it out on the boat alive. It makes it all the more heartbreaking, since out of the four of them, Bill was the most excited about the boat idea, living on an island, teaching Lewis how to fish. Sad stuff. Even though development for the first title didn't last as long as some players would have preferred, the fact that they did end up releasing more content for the game, even after the sequel came out, is very nice. I think pretty highly of Valve, even if I don't enjoy all of their games as much as others do. I wish more studios would support their games in this way, and also be as open to the community and mods as they clearly are. All of the post-launch content for Left 4 Dead was free, except on the Xbox 360, where the Crash Course and Sacrifice campaigns went for 560 Microsoft points, 7 bucks or so. Add on the fact that they have to pay to play online. Great stuff. Thanks, Microsoft. At least they got the survival mode for free, I guess. I'm not sure why I'm saying they. I bought this shit when I was younger. Gee, thanks Microsoft, you fucks. PC players also get the benefit of the community-made maps as well. 
Even though they aren't quite as good as the official Left 4 Dead campaigns, they're different enough to make it feel like you're playing something fresh and distinct, which is all you can really ask for. The more popular ones I played were Dead City, Night Terror, and Death Aboard. I feel kind of weird talking about mod campaigns, since it clearly doesn't say anything about the official game or the decisions made by the designers, but what the heck, I'll give it a try. Dead City had some things going for it and some things going against it. The levels overall felt too long, I'd often feel fatigued when I got to the safe room. The early stages especially just drag on and on. I also didn't really get a sense of progress, it was like we were walking through a maze of fences, offices, and alleys, all of which being within eyesight of where we just came from. The right way to go often felt random and disconnected, with no real driving force behind our decisions, like going up the elevator for a long time, only to go all the way back down through the many holes in the office floors. The urban environments are normally my favorite settings for campaigns, but because there was a lack of neon signs and other fun light sources, it felt very homogenous. That said, it did give the impression that this was a dead city, which was its goal, so I can't be too upset about it. At one point, you get to drive a tank, kinda, which was cool. The finale was very confusing, however. I punched a ticket, I guess, then we had to hold out for the subway car, except because dialogue specific for this campaign can't exist, and prompts didn't tell me what was going on, I really had no idea what we were supposed to do. I saw some train cars go by as the tanks and hordes of zombies were spawning and was very confused. In the end, it worked, I guess, even if I had to kill Lewis for the train to start moving. I don't know how much control community members have over the director and their spawn points, but there were some issues. The three basic special infected kept spawning together, side by side practically, almost always in the same location. It felt really weird and didn't give them enough room to operate. Likewise, the reason my buddy and I quit out of this one in co-op was because the spawning of the zombies in the parking garage was out of control. They wouldn't stop, and we could even see them teleport in one by one. Perhaps this could be chalked up to the modded server we were on, since it did increase horde sizes. That was actually the most frustrating part of playing community maps, the mod servers. With official campaigns, hosting a local server was fine, but we couldn't do a local server for the add-on campaigns. I looked it up after we were done, and it might have something to do with our mods not being compatible with each other's. Either way, I think it's incredibly dumb how the official servers aren't always an option, even when you're playing Versus or online campaign. I don't want to play the game with your wacky rules, dude, I'm sorry. This is why I had to give Night Terror a shot by myself, since the only server we could manage with this one gave the tanks a ridiculous amount of health and added a bunch of text on screen. And removed gunshot noises entirely. I do think the guns are normally a bit too loud, but this is going overboard. Night Terror is a pretty good time, though. It's essentially a haunted house. Well, until later on where it completely changes what it is. The worst part of this campaign was easily the trick elevator, since it takes a ludicrously long time to activate and do its thing. The best part, hands down, was the Moria level. This is literally Moria from Fellowship of the Ring. You do have to hold E far too long on the book to proceed, but beyond that, this level is fantastic. The tanks and zombies rushing at you when you cross the bridge at the end was funny, but honestly, the stairs to get down there looked so pretty. I also liked the jungle level afterwards, where there are traps that can instantly incapacitate you. Good stuff. Death Aboard is probably the best of the bunch. The chapters were all a decent length, the gimmicks were all unique and believable, and the setting was very interesting. The ship itself being tilted made it feel very different from anything else I had played. That chapter, however, was made a little worse since the zombies couldn't stay on the map after death, they vanished almost immediately. I also had a strange audio issue where every time my buddy shot, it was like thunder. The escape vehicle being a hot air balloon was also kind of funny, and even though the finale map felt way too big, the trek back down to get to the balloon was properly nerve-wracking as a result. One of the things I really liked about Dead City and Death Aboard was how they handled the car alarms. Both of them being new settings, of course, means you don't know where the alarmed cars will be, but even still, the placements of them were pretty clever. In Dead City, there's one at the end of this corridor here, which seems like bait almost, since you'll likely shoot that direction before hearing the chirp of the alarm. My mic volume unfortunately gets overshadowed by the extremely loud game, but here is my reaction to it, which was essentially immediate approval. Oh, shit. Oh, son of That's a good place for 
The one in Death Aboard was much funnier, however. Have a listen. Nice. Ladder. <laughs> yeah, definitely didn't expect a car to come barreling at me. Fun times. I know none of this is super worthwhile analysis, but I felt it would be fun to include a slice of the community in here as well, since it's such a big part of Left 4 Dead. All of this being said, there's a question you may be asking, or about to, or already have typed in the comments. Why play Left 4 Dead 1 if Left 4 Dead 2 is far more populated with players, has all of the campaigns from the first game, and hosts a ton of new weapons, mechanics, modes, and even enemies? The biggest changes, from my point of view, come from the addition of melee weapons and the new special infected guns, upgrades, and throwables along the way. This isn't me picking a favorite, by the way. I'm not here to preach about why Left 4 Dead 1 is the best and Left 4 Dead 2 is way worse or anything, but there are things to consider. The mood of the campaigns in the sequel does feel a bit lighter, most notably the music all around has a more southerny twang to it, and daytime is a thing which obviously makes certain areas not feel quite as scary. However, none of that really factors into this discussion, since the original game's music with the piano and horned instruments are what plays when you pick the first game's campaigns. When strictly looking at the levels that are in both titles, the biggest factors are the gameplay changes. Without rebalancing things by including more survivors at once, you really can't keep the Boomer, Hunter, and Smoker as present as before. The Spitter, Charger, and Jockey add to the pool of Special Infected the director can pick from, and even though they do encourage teamwork and punish solo play in their own ways, they aren't as elegant as the original three. In the first game, the only Special Infected available will naturally synergize with each other quite well, so no matter what, you'll always be facing a trio that makes each other better. That isn't always the case when there are six special infected to pull from. It does open the door to more varied and potentially even more interesting 1-2 combos, but preferring the simplified roster of Boomer, Hunter, and Smoker, I think, makes sense enough on its own. I know most people really like the melee weapons and new guns, and don't get me wrong, they're fun to use, but I can't help but feel that they take away from the perfect efficiency Left 4 Dead 1 had going for it, and the teamwork element in a way as well. Instead of one sidearm, two starting guns, and three tier two guns, there's like so much more to pick from. Variety does have its drawbacks, and in terms of weapon selection, I don't think it's as balanced as before. In fact, because the game has so many different selections to throw out the player, the maps nearly resemble a zombie killing playground. Everywhere you look, there's a new powerful gun. It sometimes felt like you weren't necessarily trying to survive, but getting new toys to play with. Again, I'm not wholesale criticizing this, but I do think the first game did more with less. As much as I initially wanted to disavow the melee weapons, since they sometimes make mobs of zombies trivial to deal with, it does seem like in certain climactic moments the mobs were increased drastically to balance that out. When not in a crescendo or panic event, however, it is a little too simple. In Left 4 Dead 1, you had to shove back the horde surrounding you, either shooting when you cleared space, or rely on your allies to take out the zombies for you. Don't get me wrong, smacking them in the face with a shovel or grinding the swarm to liquid as they charge at your chainsaw is definitely fun, but at the very least, some of the tension is lost with the melee weapon addition. All of this is why some people may prefer the first Left 4 Dead over the second. Shiny new things are nice, but the simple efficiency of the first game is alluring in its own way. Maybe you might disagree, and that's fine, but in the end, I think we can all agree that both Left 4 Dead games are great and well worth playing even to this day. As silly as it may sound, I could honestly play the Left 4 Dead campaigns over and over again with friends or even with bots if I have to and have a great freaking time. The presentation is always top notch, the characters are enjoyable to listen to, the gameplay is solid all around, the AI director makes every playthrough feel different enough to not get stale, and the mechanics all feed into each other with almost nothing being underutilized. It's so good. Truly a masterpiece of a game. I definitely didn't think I'd be calling this game a masterpiece when I started this script, but playing it again after all of these years, and especially with an extra decade plus of gaming experience under my belt, I can now so easily see how close to perfection Left 4 Dead is and was. If you're too young to remember when the game came out and are quick to lump this in with the plethora of other zombie shooters, truly, take a few minutes to research for yourself what the gaming landscape was like back in the mid-2000s. 
Left 4 Dead was a godsend to so many that were asking for a zombie apocalypse game, especially the people who were playing on PC. I can't imagine the joy of someone who loved Half-Life and Team Fortress, loved zombies and horror media, just binged the orange box, then has this golden god of a game released in 2008. What a time to be alive. Or undead. Is that a, is that a clever thing to say at the end of it? Oh, whatever. I'm, I'm done. Thanks for watching, folks, and thanks to my Patreon supporters, some of which should be scrolling by right now. I hope you like this video enough to give me a few bucks on Patreon, or to even like the video. Honestly, I feel a little out of my depth here. I really don't know if this video is good. I spent a lot longer on it than I was expecting. I do think this game is a masterpiece, but coming from me, a person who isn't that skilled or well-versed in the multiplayer FPS genre, I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm the right messenger. Either way, let me know what you think, and if I missed anything or said something stupid. Okay, bye-bye. Hey, watch out for that goddamn steam pipe. Man, I love steam. Yeah, steam's alright, I guess.